Good morning. Welcome to WFLHCA. Good morning, Janet. How are you? I'm fine, Dr. Harrison. How are you? I missed the last few meetings, You're but I was able to be here today. I hey, had some cardi so, we're so cardiology glad uh, CV service line meetings at 7 on these days sometimes. So glad you could come. Yeah. Come, we How have, are you? Uh, Mary Daniels, good morning. We have uh, Pooh. Good morning, Pooh. How are you this morning? Good. How are you? Good morning. Oh, good. Glad to have you. Teresa Stone, Christine Dawson, I think we're ready to get started. We don't see Largo Medical Center, but they'll they'll drop in sometime. We are posting to cardiacarecritique.com, and uh, we're a little delayed on our posting now. We're a week behind, but we will be posting the webinars, and uh, so we're very interested in uh, talking about Watson and artificial intelligence, something called deep learning, also called cognitive computing, a lot of words for it. But uh, we're going to explore this today because we think that this is going to be extremely important in medicine as it is probably in business, legal, and several other service fields uh, that are applying this now and we're going to talk about this application, what Watson means, how big is Watson, where does it fit, what's the software, what's the hardware, what's the service, how do we feed the beast and how does it help us and so we have been discussing with IBM Watson imaging team how we can apply this to cardiac imaging and specifically to rec early recognition by plaque of someone who's going to have a heart attack, prevention, keeping up with the data and the literature, and uh, pacing all this at one time with uh, cognitive computing. So we were very fortunate this month to have Nigel on our service, who is a th third year cardiac fellow from Northside, who uh, has an inquisitive mind and a great curiosity and uh, just really segues with us quite well here. So we're going to give the podium over to Nigel and uh, Nigel's going to lead us hopefully to the promised land. Nigel? Good morning. So my name is Nigel. I'm a uh, third year cardiology fellow at, Saint Pe um, at Northside Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, I have a strong interest in uh, prevention and today we'll be talking about um, IBM Watson. So we've gone a long way from um, computing from the 1900s to present day. So 1900s computers are pretty much or um, used for tabulating simple calculations and then in 1950s up until the 2000s, uh, computers were predominantly programmed, um, pretty much taught what to do, and um, now we're starting to evolve with now the use of computers for uh, probabilistic applications, um, use computer to compute and draw conclusions, um, and one feature that I thought was pretty cool was the uh, natural language component where you could speak to a computer and it will be able to um, give you an answer. So for example, the iPhone with Siri, you can ask Siri a question and it will search the internet and come up with a, an answer. Um, so today we'll be exploring artificial intelligence in uh, medicine. So IBM Watson has been incorporated into um, multiple different companies. So, uh, for example, the Cleveland Clinic, CVS, Medtronics, um, Siemens, and even um, the American Heart has been um, working with Watson. Um, these are just a list of multiple partnerships that companies have with IBM um, and incorporating Watson to either improve care, uh, decrease cost, a whole host of applications. 
So what exactly oh. is Watson? Um, so it's a artificial intelligence can read up to um, 200,000 patterns per second. Uh, I read one statistic that they could read um, 500 charts in just six seconds. So that's pretty impressive. Um, it actually was a contestant on Jeopardy, and um, as you can see here, Watson's uh, dollar amount was more than um, two previous winners, and it was also a uh, champion um, on Go, which is you can see over here. Um, so it's a uh, using its software and hardware powered primarily by the Power 7 processor, it's able to um, compute massive amounts of data in a very short time frame. Um, it has a 16 terabyte um, RAM processor. Typical computers usually use four to six, uh, four to eight gigabytes of RAM. This uses about 16. Um, it has 750 servers. Um, so it's able, with its hardware and software, it's able to compute massive amounts of data in a very, very short and efficient um, time frame. Um, so it, for Merge Healthcare, it uh, has $30 billion worth of images um, and able to uh, sort through claims data and patient records very rapidly for a large volume of um, patients. And the issue now with healthcare, I believe, is that just the massive amounts of data with the age of the internet, data has been transformed from paper to electronic and being um, produced rapidly and move across the world rapidly. So that has created an exponential growth of data. Um, and with that, there is a increase of data that is not useful, data that um, can actually lead you to be less productive, and um, some of this probably may be attributed for the rising healthcare costs. So the total healthcare cost in the United States is $750 billion, and um, a third of that is actually wasted. So by becoming more efficient, you could decrease cost and waste. So these are the, uh, I guess, the improvements that you can see using Watson. So, um, for example, for the fee-for-service to um, accountable change organizations, um, you can become more efficient by decreasing cost and waste. For example, um, unnecessary procedures or repeating procedures that was previously done. Um, there's a focus on wellness and prevention more now than ever because of this increasing in cost. Um, there's also uh, information overload. Uh, physicians are now um, demanding more to see more data, um, understand more data, and and analyze, compute, and co devise conclusions from all the, these sources of data, from medical records, the medical literature, um, and also. There's increased complexity, so there's shortage of physician, increased demand, and then, like I mentioned, there's an increase in cost. So if you look at the a plot of GDP over um, versus that of healthcare costs, as healthcare costs has been rapidly increasing, um, disproportionate to that of GDP. So the ways that Watson is able to um, assistant healthcare, it's able to understand natural language. So you can ask Watson a question, it will um, evaluate the data, come up with hypotheses, and even able to learn based on previous data and previous conclusions. Um, so things that it's able to do is, for example, um, oncology genomics, which I'll be talking about later. Uh, there's also a large, large cloud platform for healthcare, um, able to analyze patient charts. Um, even though um, we can't predict heart attacks, we can find patterns and able to use previous data to 
devise risk stratification to better understand um, which patients are more risk at versus those of less risk by using electronic medical records, previous charts, um, outcomes data. And I get, believe, I guess, this is our Watson team. Um, yes. So a whole host of, of individuals that are able to um, assist in uh, bringing Watson to uh, healthcare. So that Watson has multiple focus. Our focus today will be health and um, medicine, but there's a lot of work done with Watson in management and cost analysis and legal sports, um, city infrastructure, and even manufacturing and cutting costs, cutting waste, increasing efficiency. So by building a database, you're able to have a larger pool of information that Watson can analyze. Um, and analyzing the data, coming up with evidence-based learning, and then able to make decisions based on all this information. Um, so the key is asking the right questions. Um, uh, Watson will um, interpret, evaluate, and then decide based on, on the question. Um, it's able to break down sentences um, and ingest unstructured data. So. Um, the three classes of cognitive services ask the server and decide. So asking a um, question for greater insight, uh, natural language inquiries, and then discover based on the information um, and finding a rational answer. And then decide, which means that it would ingest, analyze um, domain sources and generate evidence-based decisions. Um, so the hope is to collect um, corpus of data for Watson and then curate the contents of the data. Um, and then Watson will be able to ingest the corpus by pre-processing and build indices and other metadata to create a knowledge graph for answering more uh, precise questions. And then by us training um, Watson, then we can able to acquire and find patterns that were not previously discovered that was not so obvious, but I, by using Watson and, and now its ability to self-analyze data, um, come up with conclusions. Um, so IBM Watson is able to, based on that, able to uh, learn and integrate the data um, and by form, formulating conclusions. Um, it's able to keep up to date with new relevant publications um, and readily responds to questions in a um, highly complex, for high, highly complex situations. Uh, so the common approaches would be, um, it would identify speech, generate hypotheses, and look for evidence to support or refute the hypothesis. Um, it scores each um, data based on a statistical model of weighing those that are um, stronger in evidence versus those that are weaker in evidence and then it's able to derive possibilities from all this data and after that it's able to also incorporate evidence-based learning. Um, one of the, the key advantages one of the key advantages is that it's able to con consider a large amount of data in a very short period of time. Um, it's unbiased compared to physicians um, and it's able to learn. It's able also, also to identify if there's missing information or things that has not been considered um, and it's not limited by a simple database structure. It incorporates the clouds, patients' charts, uh, medical literature, guidelines, etc. So uh, when we Google something or we look at something on the internet, there's a huge difference between searching for something and having something um, analyzed after you um, ask a question. Um, so if you uh, use the search into Google um, a question, it will pop up things that have uh, th that phraseology, but Watson would pick apart the phrase and um, devise a 
conclusion based on the possible um, answer to the questions. And then it would weigh those possible answers in terms of stronger versus weaker evidence and come up with a conclusion. Um, this is a, a pretty good slide from New England Journal looking at how physicians make that, um, a conclusion or a diagnosis. So we'll start off with um, the patient story, data acquisition, and generate a hypothesis. And this will all, all incorporate knowledge, context, and, and experience. Um, so Watson sort of has a different approach. There's a uh, question, and then it um, queries the decomposition, and then goes through uh, multiple hypothesis generation simultaneously, um, and then scores the evidence from stronger to weaker, and then synthesizes and um, comes comes up with a conclusion. So, for example, this is a um, Watson's uh, method of analyzing an HPI. So it go through um, modifiers, symptoms, the disease, and um, medications, and use all of that in when it's asked a question regarding a patient. Um, so there, after asking a question, there are several interpretations. It goes through um, hundreds of resources, and those resources are then also explored individually um, for several cycles, and then it would um, come up with a uh, c conclusion. So it's taught by example, so it's not programmable, as opposed to computers that are programmable where you um, tell the computer what it can and cannot do. Um, it's able to generate hypotheses appropriate to each individual case, and um, these hypotheses are the result of probabilistic treatment responses um, based on the data analyzed, and it's able to rational and rationalize and um, recommend a conclusion based on this. So uh, much of the data for Watson thus far in medicine has been from um, malignant uh, cancer research. So I'll go into a couple of um, things that it was able to do. So for example, the Sloan Kettering uses it and it's able to extract um, key elements from a patient's case. Then it's able, by incorporating data from guidelines and um, medical charts, it searches that and then finally implements it into um, probabilistic treatment and evidence. Uh, with cancer research rapidly expanding and several treatments for every cancer, um, each pa and each patient responding differently, it's able to incorporate all of that and come, uh, determine a conclusion. So, for example, in slow Kettering, it's able to an analyze patients charts and historical cases from 5,000 plus um, Memorial Sloan Kettering um, physician and analyze this data in for each patient's case, so it's able to better individualize care. Um, IBM Watson was also used for uh, protein kinase activity of P53, which is a uh, tumor suppressor gene, and it was data was uploaded from um, 100,000 um, articles, and they were able to extract this data and generate hypotheses based on new approaches um, of treating tumors associated with a P53 mutation. Um, it was also used in genomic analysis because of all the multiple mutations and the inability to compute um, each single mutation and determine which ones are higher or lower probability for um, causing malignancies. It used case-specific analysis um, for identifying specific mutations and gene patterns that were associated with malignancies and also drug therapy. and um, response to, to treatment. Um, Watson has also been incorporated by um, the American Heart Association, so given uh, that the AHA is probably one of the largest employers um, for prevention, it's, uh, they focused on using Watson for creating a, um, a method of boosting employees' health and integrating 
um, employer and employee relationship to better engage patients in their own health and, and methods of doing that. Um, and there's also um, one article I found with uh, using artificial intelligence such as Watson for um, cardiac imaging and basically they, they focus on the rapidly expanding pool of data so um, looking at patient cases analyzing and mining all this data from patient cases and outcomes um, assessing their charge they're assessing their um, chart and um, possible outcomes for each patient and then finally drawing conclusions um, and this would theoretically lead to more individualized care and guiding treatment um, so just to wrap up uh, conclusions um, so that is rapidly expanding medicine from um, medical literature to expanding on observational studies um, looking at charts um, and Watson is able to uh, understand language asking you so you're able to ask Watson a question it um, use data from experts which well we use data from experts to feed Watson and mine the data drawing evidence-based conclusions um, and like I mentioned it's able to use data from EMR patients previous medical uh, records um, prior procedures prior tests and using massive volumes of evidence from medical literature guidelines, physician notes, um, patient outcome data, and patient's response to therapy. Um, and by doing so, we can improve efficiency for the providers and able to filter all this data um, and incorporate it into um, medicine today. And this would aid in management, prescribing, and um, one of the most important features of Watson is that it's able to evolve and learn without any input from um, without any guided input from from um, the programmers and I'll turn it over back to Dr. Harrison oh, sorry. Oh. so thank you Nigel you rushed through these slides very fast and there's some questions that I have that uh, we can go over and find out more about and so some of the questions that were interesting to me is is the influence of bias and that, that seems to be keep coming up that we as clinicians have a great deal of bias and our bias is interfering with our function and so can you explain I know that we've done there's a lot of research by Kahneman and others uh, they won the Nobel Prize in terms of investing and in economics and the bias that's involved in economics. But I thought in medicine uh, that we could uh, pretty well clean our hard drives personally and uh, not be so biased. And so can you tell me what, what is this big thing about bias and how is that influencing us? And then we'll go over some of these things that you rushed through that I'm really not sure about, okay? I think a lot of our, our decisions in, in medicine are probably influenced by um, previous experience, things that we've seen, um, and uh, that bias probably incorpor is incorporated to each physician and how they treat patients. Um, sometimes it's for the better, sometimes it may influence um, our decisions and have adverse outcomes. Um, and if you have a, um, a system such as Watson which is more objective, um, that pretty much eliminates bias and, and is able to draw conclusions more so based on data and um, with l no influence really on previous um, experiences. So there's no question that uh, we operate under our experience and we build patterns and continue to get patterns uh, and these patterns have been very helpful and uh, establishing patient care models and uh, but uh, it seems like we would understand uh, what our bias is and be able to uh, state that I'm very biased about this but to play the devil's advocate so to speak let's look at it another way and so it seems like we do that quite a bit and uh, so I'm not sure how ingrained bias is in our decision-making uh, 
uh, other than it, recognizing it and stating it, which uh, basically then makes it uh, no longer uh, a significant bias. Let's look at uh, Watson and some of the things that were important to it. Breaking down the sentences is extremely important, that it has, uh, it understands linguistics, and so that was a big step in incorporating language uh, and making it so we can ask the right questions. Most of us have been trained in many ways to, uh, since being medical students, to have the answers, and we've not been trained to have the questions. And so our teachers have the questions and we have the answers, or we try to have the answers. Usually if you ask a medical student a question, he'll come up with an answer for sure. It may not be the right answer, but it's an answer. But now we, we're challenged uh, to come up with the right question. And so that's a different frame of mind that we have to develop in, in medical school and in our training of our residents and fellows of what question do you want to ask. And obviously there are a lot of questions to ask. Uh, which one is the right question, and so uh, that's important. The other important things to note here is we got to collect the corpus of data, so we should have that. We may not have it readily indexed uh, as a bibliography. Uh, there's a lot of paper involved, and a lot of people have paper journals still, but uh, we need EM to feed Watson. The other thing that uh, electronic medical records are being used to feed Watson, and unfortunately our med electronic medical records are um, sloppy and waste. Uh, and 75% of what we're accumulating in the EMR is copy and paste, or sloppy and waste as I call it, and then it's called note bloat. And so we're building up all this uh, nothing data that's just a duplication of a duplication of a duplication. And the reason why we do that is that the Medicare billing structure is such that in order to build a level five, you have to present the same data that the last person presented. And so that would be very destructive if Wikipedia was based on that. The Wikipedia is based on adding new data, and each time it's too bad the medical record can't be uh, adding new data instead of reproducing the same data over and over and over again. And so Watson, fortunately, can go through that really fast but we're wasting its time, even we're wasting seconds on Watson, uh, pro post-processing a bunch of data that's useless and repetitive. And so uh, it's too bad we can't redesign our medical charts to actually keep two sets of books, so we say in accounting. And one set of books would be the EMR for Medicare, where we keep reduplicating crap and uh, building this uh, big database that's uh, stored in uh, storage units with air conditioning to keep it cool and servers. And then the other would be the real set of books, which is basically a Wikipedia set of books, where we only add new data and uh, or we question old data that's already existing there. And so uh, that would be a big suggestion for medical records. It's really amazing that all of that is built on a Medicare reimbursement policy which uh, is stupid, as many things are that are governmental. And so let's go to uh, some more of the uh, things that you presented that uh, probably need a little more depth. And so uh, let me see what else you have here. There was some more come. This is very interesting to see how this is working. Uh, primary search, candidate answer generation, supporting evidence retrieval, deep evidence scoring, final merging and ranking, and uh, usually we don't rank our evidence. And so we have to learn how to rank evidence now with confidence levels. Uh, here's uh, data going through a medical journal and picking out keywords. Yeah, we do that. We do keywords. This is like speed reading. And, uh, this is what we do when we do when we learn speed reading is how to pick up keywords and, uh, and to read this thing really fast. And uh, we do that in medicine quite keenly uh, because we're trained when we take standardized tests that uh, we're trained to know that there's a timer and uh, so standardized testing doesn't work without timing and so we have to time ourselves just like just the same way so uh, let's look through and see what the cognitive uh, solution is and so it's taught by example not programmed and so that's a giant leap uh, gives the ability to learn and adapt. So that means that we have to keep 
putting information in and having a dialogue. And then as we have a dialogue, we have to have an expert that has to comb through the dialogue and uh, decide how to weigh that in terms of uh, feeding that dialogue to Watson because there's no weight on it. Uh, when we're talking about stuff and answering questions, we have no weight. And so there has to be a confidence weighted material. So I see Watson is something we have to keep, one, feeding new data in, and two, evaluating stuff that's already there and weighting it. And so there's got to be a, a way of our learning how to do that. And I'm sure that the Watson programmers will teach us how to do that because I don't know how, to, how we're going to do that at this time. Uh, oncology, let's look at Watson Oncology and extract key attributes from a patient's case. And here's a 61-year-old lady that has this. And use these attributes to find candidate treatment options as determined by consulting NCCN guidelines. Well, that's a problem because if we're using the guidelines, the guidelines frequently are written once every five years. And so uh, we have to start updating our guidelines electronically. And so the guidelines, uh, which are being memorized by medical students for regurgitation on a test, uh, are going to be changed perhaps daily uh, as we upgrade our guidelines, perhaps with a Watson-type computer that's going to keep the guidelines current. And so then, in that case, Watson will be feeding Watson. Wow, that uh, raises a lot of questions. We got one computer feeding the other computer. Uh, where are we going with that? And so, but our guidelines are going to have to change. So a medical student, the day before the test, has to look up and see what the new guidelines are today. So it's got to be a moving target. We can't have di guidelines cast in concrete as they are. So a patient uh, showed up the other day at Tampa General, and he's a 76-year-old guy who is 20 minutes within a stroke. And so this is always a dilemma for a stroke team because stroke teams uh, have been organized around the fact that 95% of people show up three hours after the stroke has begun. And so the ones that we can save are the ones that show up within the first three hour, and those are the golden patients. But we wouldn't have a team if we were built around expecting those to show up because they don't. So 95% of people come in uh, three hours after the stroke. So in order to have a team and in order to be funded, we have to use those people as our target. So then the 5% five five of people show up uh, within the golden hour. We don't know what to do with them because they're outside of our uh, bell-shaped curve. So this guy shows up within 20 minutes of a, a stroke. Same thing happened to me with somebody uh, four years ago, and the system still hasn't doesn't know what to do. And so uh, basically, First, the patient is rejected uh, because he's 76, and their guidelines say 75. And so then they're buzzing around trying to decide what to do and losing valuable time. And then the next thing that comes up is uh, they have a standard approach is to run an INR. Even if you're not on Coumadin, and even if you don't have liver disease, they're going to do a statin INR. That's their protocol. So guidelines, again, can be choking the system. So they, they do an INR. And the INR basically comes back 3.5. So 3.5 is a no-go. It's a, it's a red light on the program, so you can't do it. So then everything stops. And so then someone comes along and, who's a brother-in-law of the patient who's a hematologist. And so the guy's INR can't be 3.5. He's not on Coumadin. He doesn't have liver disease. And he's a hematologist, too. The patient's a hematologist. So now, you know, they go back and they're going to do another stat INR. Of course... You know, we have to teach Watson. One of the things we have to teach Watson is you never believe any one laboratory test. Never believe any one laboratory test. And also, you put together a gestalt of all this information. If one piece of data doesn't fit, you throw it out. Okay? Watson has to learn that. A constellation, this constellation looks like the Big Dipper, but it's got this other arm coming off the back. Well, that, those stars aren't part of the Big Dipper, so you got to throw those out. And so you create a constellation, and you see what's part of the constellation and what doesn't fit. So they repeat the INR. This takes time. You know, they don't have point-of-care INR in the ER, okay, for this system that's a rapid response system. You've got some whole bunch of trained people, and they're all standing around waiting for the lab to come do an INR, 
and then repeat the INR and get the database. And so they come back with the INR is, is okay, it's normal. INR is one. And so, they say, oh, oh, we're back on again. So it's back green light again. So basically, then the patient's going to be taken, uh, get a CT scan, make sure he hasn't bled, start uh, thrombolytic therapy. Well, thrombolytic therapy doesn't work in a big 76-year-old person, especially somebody with atrial fibrillation, because that means the clot, this has got atrial flutter, this patient does, that means the clot comes from the left atrial appendage. Clots in the left atrial appendage are big clots. They're well-organized, big clots, and they go to a big middle cerebral artery, and if they occlude it, it's got to be a big clot, and it's a big artery and a big guy, so it's not going to dissolve. So we started thrombolytic therapy in someone, it's not going to work. Definitely not going to work. 95% chance it's not going to work. And so now we're supposed to simultaneously be going to uh, the uh, interventional laboratory to take the clot out. So we're on our way there, and we're waiting for somebody to show up who's the extractor, who's going to use the uh, stent extractor called a solitaire to take the clot out. So the guy's, the guy's on his way, and he's not there. So basically the procedure starts within the same standard that they have of 95% of people come in after three hours of stroke. They start the procedure three hours after the stroke, after the onset of the stroke. So the system fails. It's a system fail. I don't know what Watson's going to do. Is Watson going to blow up when the system fails? <laughs> but the system fails again four, hour, four years later after we tested the system. We test it again, and it fails. So finally the clot's extracted, blah, blah, blah. Guy wakes up the next day. He's moving stuff, you know, but we don't get the overall benefit. Nor is there any evaluation of is he taking any medications that may help reperfusion injury? Is there something we can give him to help reperfusion injury? And so that hasn't been focused on either. And so those are those are the problems that we have to do deal with. And so we have this is going to be a lot of stuff, you know. We have a lot of problems to work on. Okay, so let's look at these pieces of data that we're putting in. Uh, every month we're, ad we're adding more cases that we're analyzing. Well, I see a lot of the data on the chart is wrong. And so we have hospitalists that are working through 30 patients in a day, and uh, these hospitalists then are dictating a history and physical. What's Watson going to do when it says, one part of the chart, you know, a guy's a smoker in a 50-pack year. It's another chart of the part, chart, the guy's never smoked in his life. So what's Watson going to do with conflicting data? Do you take three histories and physicals? And then, of course, if it's uh, copy and paste, then you're going to paste that maybe four times. So it's going to be five pieces of data confirming something that's not true. And so we see that all the time uh, where a hospital is in a hurry, and so he takes down data that's not true and uh, says, yes, positive coronary artery disease. Patients never had coronary artery disease. We see it all the time. So we have certainly have to screen what we're putting in there. And then, of course, we're going to duplicate it four or five times when we copy and paste. And so that's going to make it very difficult. Uh, so how are we going to deal with that? And these publications, somebody has to go over these publications, these new articles, uh, the 100,000 are being added, okay? Somebody has to go over those because a bunch of them are worthless. Basically, how many articles do you see retracted now, you know, that have been published? Uh, a whole wealth of data on beta blockers uh, on patients preoperatively who are having non-cardiac surgery. A whole bunch of data has been retracted. Many pieces of data on stem cell therapy uh, that were done in South Korea have been retracted. And so we've got, we've got the entire Russian database that was used in a huge research study that has to be retracted uh, because we don't even think they used spironolactone. We think they sold the drug on the black market. And, and the control group is no different from the drug group. Okay, so we don't think they even used the drug. And so what do we do? That means that we have to have experts that have got to read these 100,000 new articles and discuss them, weigh them, so they can't be just high school dropouts, you know, that are data input people. 
they've got to be people that can weigh and evaluate these articles and put some weight on them so the weight actually goes into Watson already weighted by experts. Okay, are some data we don't even put in there because they're worthless. Like if you look at our journals, we've got when you look at journals and you think about double blind randomized valid studies, uh, let's see, New England Journal is probably ranked maybe two, JAMA's ranked maybe one or two. Jack, which is our cardiology journal, is way down the line. It's got like 15% randomized controlled studies. The rest of it's anecdotal, you know, representative, observational, you know, and we've got more and more journals. We keep adding to it. We have a new cardiology JAMA journal, new cardiology imaging JAMA journal. And so we've got all these journals. All these people are publicizing all this stuff, of which very little of it uh, fits into randomized controlled studies. So we're going to have to have a lot of people that are involved in what goes into Watson. So say we put stuff in Watson uh, that's a uh, Bullshit. Say we put stuff in Watson that's that's not true, and uh, then we're gonna have so we're gonna have a corrupt Watson, and we're gonna have a real Watson. We're gonna have some Watsons are gonna be better than others. Like I know researchers who publish data, and they say, well, a uh, patient is class two after having had repair of the mitral valve or repair of the tricuspid valve. How about that? Class two. And I look at those patients. I say, they're not class two. They're class three. You know. This guy's cheating and writing the article and saying they're class two because he wants to look good in the medical literature. And then all the stuff that, if they are class three, we're not going to publish it, okay? Because we don't want to tell people that we're cranking out patients that are class three. They started out class three. We did surgery, and they're class three still. And so that's not going to be published. So we're going to put all this stuff into Watson. And so we're going to have some pure Watson. So we're going to have some Watsons wearing white hats. And some Watsons are going to wear black hats and uh, be corrupt Watsons because we put corrupt data into them. How are we going to deal with that? So this raises just a huge amount of ethical questions about where we're going with this. And so I'm really interested in being part of the Watson story. And uh, Mary Daniels is on here. She's interested in doing that too. But you can see that there's a lot of work we got to do before we can bring Watson out to everybody all the time in medical care because it means so much. And so uh, those are some of my thoughts. Uh, does anyone have any other thoughts? Uh, Mary, would you like to make some comments? We have Mary Daniels from Vital Images. Hello, Hi. Mary. Good morning. Hey, how well, are you? I think it, yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Good. Nice and cold. How cold up there in Minnesota? Uh, we were in the minus yesterday. Oh, probably. I hate to hear that. I'm glad I'm not we're coming up there now, but I can invite uh, Vital Images to come down here and visit now that it's cold oh, up there. You guys are welcome. It's like 75 degrees down here. Come on down and take a swim in my pool, and uh, we'll go sailing, and, uh, and we'll talk about uh, Watson down here and have a little meeting. That sounds good. So, Mary, uh, did you hear all the things I had to say about Watson? Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a ways to go in, in uh, developing this and getting the right data and everything in. And Yeah, so that's uh, going to be tough. We're gonna have, there's going to be a lot of people that have to be responsible to screening our database, including yeah. note-bloated medical records uh, that are kind of craziness. Yeah, it's amazing how fast it can process all that information, though, and go through all those charts in such a short period of time. Yeah, it's, so it's amazing it's how much garbage we're going to be giving it. And, of course, garbage in equals garbage out, no matter how fast you can process it. You can quote me on that one. Garbage in <laughs> equals garbage out, no matter how fast you process it. Yeah, that's a good point. That's my new quote for the day. I like that. Yeah. We're even now, on quotes. <laughs> That's right up there with uh, Mary Daniels. The plaque is back. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. We, we enjoyed our meeting, and uh, we'll talk some more about this. This is not going to go away. Watson, artificial intelligence, cognitive computing, imaging is not going to go away. And 
if there's any radiologists listening in or are going to review this, this is not going to replace radiologists very fast, the way I see it. Uh, so thank you so much for your attendance. We look forward to next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.